In the summer of 1874, I was in Liverpool, and having finished my business, I felt that a long sea voyage would be agreeable. So instead of embarking on one of the many fine passenger steamers, I booked for New York on the sailing vessel Morrow. The Morrow was an English ship with little accommodation for passengers, of whom there were only myself, a young woman and her servant. It was from the latter that I learned that the young lady had been left with an English family by a man and his wife from South Carolina, both of whom had died on the same day at a house in Devonshire, a circumstance in itself sufficiently uncommon to remain rather distinctively in my memory, even had it not transpired in conversation with the servant lady that the name of the man was William Jarrett, the same as my own. I knew that a branch of my family had settled in South Carolina, but of them and their history I was ignorant. The morrow set sail the 15th of June. The skipper favored us with very little of his company, except at his table. And the young woman, Miss Janet Harford, and I became very well acquainted. We were nearly always together, and I often tried to analyze and define the strange feeling which she inspired in me. A secret, subtle, but powerful attraction which constantly impelled me to seek her out. But the attempt was hopeless. One evening, as we sat on deck, I asked if she could assist me in resolving my psychological frame of mind. For a moment, she was silent. And I began to fear that I had been extremely rude. And then she fixed her eyes gravely on my own. In an instant, my mind was dominated by a strange a force has ever entered human consciousness. It seemed as if she were looking at me not with, but through her eyes, from an immeasurable distance behind them. Ship, ocean, sky, all had vanished. I was conscious of nothing. And then from out of it, my former surroundings of deck and mast slowly resolved themselves. Miss Harford had closed her eyes and was leaning back in her chair, apparently asleep. The book she had been reading lay open in her lap. Impelled by some unknown motive, I glanced at the top of the page. It was a copy of that curious work, Denica's Meditations, and the lady's index finger rested on this passage. To many it is given to be drawn away and to be apart from the body for a season. For as streams which flow across each other, the weaker is borne along by the stronger. So there will be certain kin whose paths intersecting, their souls do bear company, while their bodies go their own way, unknowing. Miss Harford arose, shuddering, the sun had sunk below the horizon, but it was not cold. There was not a breath of air, no clouds, not a star in the sky. A hurried tramping sounded on the deck. The captain summoned below joined the first officer who stood looking at the barometer. We are in trouble, I heard him exclaim. An hour later, the body of Janet Harvard, invisible in the darkness and the spray, was torn from my grasp by the cruel whirlpool of the sinking ship. And I fainted in the cordage of the floating mast to which I had lashed myself. I awoke by lamplight. I lay in a berth amid the familiar surroundings of the stateroom of a steamer. 
On a couch opposite sat a man reading a book. I recognized the face of my friend Gordon Doyle, whom I had met in Liverpool on the day of my embarkation, when he was about to sail on the steamer City of Prague, on which he had urged me to accompany him. After some time, I spoke his name. Doyle, I said. Did they save her? He now looked at me and smiled as if amused. He evidently thought that I was half awake. Her? Who do you mean? he asked. Janet Harford, I replied. His amusement turned to amazement, and he stared at me, saying nothing. You will tell me after a while, I continued. What ship is this? Doyle stared again, and then replied, The city of Prague, bound from Liverpool to New York, three weeks out with a broken propeller shaft. Principal passenger, Mr. Gordon Doyle. One lunatic, Mr. William Jaddett. The two travellers embark together, but they are about to part, it being my firm intention to pitch you overboard. I sat upright. Do you mean to say that for three weeks I have been a passenger on this vessel? Have I been ill? Yes, to the first question. And no, to the second, replied Doyle. Doyle, I cried. There is a mystery here. Please be serious. Wasn't I rescued from the wreck of the ship Morrow? Doyle changed color and approached me. What do you know of Janet Harford? He asked very calmly. First, tell me what you know of her, I said. Doyle gazed at me for a moment as if to think what to do and then seated himself again on the couch. Why should I not know her, he said. I am engaged to marry Janet Harford, whom I met a year ago in London. Her family does not approve, and we eloped. Or are eloping, in fact. For on the day you and I boarded this steamer, she and her servant were boarding the ship Morrow. She would not consent to go in the same vessel with me, and it had been decided that she would take a sailing vessel in order to avoid detection. I am now afraid that this broken shaft may detain us so long that the morrow will get to New York before we do, and the poor girl will not know where to go. By the way, she is only an adopted daughter of the Harfords. Her mother was killed by being thrown from a horse, and her father killed himself the same day. The Harfords adopted her, and she grew up believing that she was their daughter. I lay still in my berth. I hardly breathed. And finally I said, Doyle, what book are you reading? Oh, he replied, it's called Denica's Meditations. Janet gave it to me. She happened to have two copies. He tossed me the volume, which opened as it fell to a marked passage. To many it is given to be drawn away and to be apart from the body for a season, for as streams which flow across each other, the weaker is borne along by the stronger, so there will be certain kin whose paths intersecting, their souls do bear company, while their bodies go their own way, unknowing. She had, as she has, a singular taste in reading, I managed to say. Yes, she said. And now perhaps you will have the kindness to explain how you knew her name and that of the ship she sailed in. You talked of her in your sleep, I said. A week later, we were towed into the port of New York but the morrow was never heard from again.
Once there was a man who was married to a lady called Elvira, and Elvira had a golden arm. It was solid, shining gold. It ran from her shoulder right down to her fingers. Elvira was very proud of her golden arm, so proud that before she went to sleep at night, she would say to her husband, if I happen to die, promise me you'll bury me with my golden arm. And he always said he would. Night after night she would ask him, and night after night he would promise. And one night, Elvira died. And the husband buried her just as he had promised, with her golden arm. And life went on for the husband. He was lonely, naturally. He had his work on the farm, he had his friends, but things weren't the same. He couldn't seem to pay attention to his work, and things went from bad to worse. And little by little, he sold the farm animals, then the carts, then the barn. And lying in bed one night, he began to think about Elvira and her golden arm. He thought about what he could do with all that gold. And it seemed a shame that Elvira's arm was buried deep in the ground. And the more he thought, the more he had to have that arm. But he had promised Elvira, and yet he needed the gold in her golden arm. At midnight, he got out of bed, dressed in his warmest clothes because it was bitter cold outside. He took his lantern and a shovel. There was no moon, and he walked in the black night to Elvira's grave, the lantern shining on the road in front of him, making shadows that half scared the man to death. And if he didn't want that golden arm so badly, he would have turned around and gone home where it was safe and warm. He came to Elvira's grave. The ground was hard because of the cold, but he dug and he dug. The hole got deeper and deeper. The night became colder and colder. And he finally reached Elvira's coffin. He opened the coffin, reached in, and took the golden arm. He covered up the coffin and fixed the earth around the grave so that no one would know what had been done. It began to snow and hail, and the wind got louder and louder as the man started back for home with the golden arm under his coat. He lit a fire, warmed himself, and looked around for some place to hide the golden arm. The only place that was safe, he thought, was under the covers of his bed. He jumped into bed and tried to keep warm, but the golden arm was cold, very cold, and the man shivered and shook. He tried to sleep, but somehow he couldn't. He tried to close his eyes, but he was afraid to keep them shut. He didn't know why, Maybe it was the wind that was keeping him awake because it got louder and louder, and then... He heard a voice in the wind. It was calling, Where is my golden arm? Imagination, the man thought. It had to be because it couldn't be anything else. But he pulled the covers over his head. He didn't want to hear the sound, or was it a voice? What was it saying? Where is my golden arm? He got out of bed to make sure. He looked out towards the road. He could hardly see it from his window. It was so dark out. But the wind carried a voice saying, Where is my golden arm? 
He went to the door to listen, to be sure. And he heard it. Where is my golden arm? And he looked into the cellar, and the voice called to him, Where is my golden arm? And the man shook and shivered, and to be safe, he went back to bed, and he still heard the voice coming from all around him, from the windows, under the door, under the bed, from the closet, and it cried and called and howled, Where is my golden arm? And then... He saw it. Where is my golden arm? At the foot of his bed. And it jumped right at him. You've got it. <laughs> they say that whenever the wind howls late at night, that it's Elvira coming to find her golden arm. Do you have it? There are lots of places in the world, all different, some strange. But there's one thing every country has, people and ghosts. And this is a story about a man who played a guitar in a city called Paramaribo in Suriname, which is in Dutch Guiana, which is in South America, which is in the Southern Hemisphere, which is on this world which has many strange things on it. Now this man in Paramaribo played a guitar, and he played it very well. He would play it in the streets, and the people liked it so much they would pay just to hear him play. He was probably the best guitar player in the whole country. Whenever anyone gave a party, they would ask the man to come and play. And he would play until very late in the night. And then he would walk to a small house, put away his guitar because it was a very good guitar. Probably the very best in the whole country. And the next day he would get up, polish his guitar, and go back into the streets and play some more. One day, the richest man in Paramaribo came to see him. My friend, the richest man said, I am having a party, and it wouldn't be a party without you to play. The guitar player was flattered and said he would come, of course. The night of the party came. The huge house was filled with people, and the guitar player was there. My friends, the rich man called out, the best guitar player in the whole world will play for us. He played better than he had ever played before. And he played until it was very, very late. And when the party was over, he walked home. It was a very dark night. And he played the guitar as he walked. He played softly to keep his mind off the dark, dark night. There was a sound from the bushes behind him. He turned and saw a man he had never seen before. That is a very good guitar, the man told him. I wonder if you would let me play it. Well, it was dark. The man was a stranger. And the guitar player was all alone. 
So he said, of course. And he gave the man the guitar. so well that the guitar was amazed. And when the stranger was finished playing, the man told him that he had never heard better playing in his whole life. Naturally, the stranger said, I was a guitar player before I died. And the guitar player ran. And the stranger ran after him, calling, Hey! You forgot your guitar. Keep it, the guitar player yelled, and he ran. And the stranger ran after him. Your guitar, he kept calling. And the guitar player ran faster and faster. And the stranger ran faster and faster until... The guitar player ran into his own house and slammed the door, lit all the lights and pulled down all the shades, and then began to wonder if he had really seen what he thought he had seen. Was there really a stranger who had played his guitar? Of course not, he thought to himself. It's all a dream. When he looked for his guitar, it wasn't there. I must have left it at the party, he thought to himself. And finally fell asleep. The next morning, he opened his door to go back to the rich man's house for his guitar. And there, on the doorstep... was the guitar. Here's your guitar, a voice said. And the man never played his guitar again. There are all kinds of scary things that live in the world. Ghosts. Vampires. Werewolves. Any number of things. And then there are bogarts. They don't make any special sort of sound. They just, well, they just. And if you really want to know if there's a bogart around, do you really want to know? Well, any sound that is not. <laughs> is a bogart. Bogarts live mostly in England. Mostly. They could live in your house, maybe. But mostly in England. Once there was a farmer and his wife. And they had a bogart. How did they know? It's hard not to know. A bogart is something nobody wants to have around. They're an awful lot of trouble. Late at night, they move around the house. And what they do is... They pull the covers off the people. They knock on doors. And when the farmer would get out of bed to see who was there, there was no one. Sometimes the bogart would find new ways to get people out of bed. 
and the farmer's wife would get up to see if the children were all right. Of course they were, just sleeping peacefully without blankets, because the bogart pulled them off. The farmer and his wife and his children were getting pretty annoyed. Sometimes late at night, the farmer would stand in the middle of the living room and try to talk to the bogart, to ask him or her or it to leave. But there was never any answer, and the farmer would shrug and go to bed. And then the bogart would answer in his own peculiar way. It would tap on the windows. It would roll heavy balls across the ceiling. It would slide down the stairs. And it would slide up the stairs. And one night, because everyone, the farmer, his wife, and all the children, tried talking to the bogart, asking it to please go away. Please let them have a night's rest for once. Please find somebody else to bother. The bogart answered them. No, it didn't talk. They don't talk except when it's really absolutely necessary. What the bogart did was this. The farmer and his wife and all their children were mad, very mad. And they decided once and for all, they wouldn't pay attention to the bogart. When it pulled off their covers, they pulled them back on. When it woke them at night, they rolled over and pretended to go back to sleep. And when the bogart broke things, they just cleaned up as though absolutely nothing had happened. The Bogart began to think that the family didn't like him, or her, or it. And it began to be very helpful. It washed the dishes, sometimes. And because it was what it was, it threw a dish every once in a while. It collected the eggs from the chickens. But being a bogart, every other egg would somehow drop or break. It milked the cows and fed the horses. But a bogart is always a bogart. So, it tied the horses' tails to the cows' tails and let them loose in the barnyard. The farmer was very mad. He had a lot of fixing up to do. The farmer's wife was annoyed. She had a lot of cleaning up to do. And the children were mad. They had a lot of helping to do. The only happy thing around the farm was the bogart. So happy that he made the cold water in the tub run hot. And the hot water run cold and went back to all his old tricks. There was only one thing to do. The farmer told his family that if they couldn't get rid of the bogart one way, they'd do it another. They'd move. Well, did you ever try to move with a bogart in the house? When one trunk was packed and everybody was busy moving the piano, the bogart emptied the trunk. And when everyone went back in to repack the trunk, they'd find the piano had somehow been put out in the barn. It was very hard, but finally the day arrived and everything was ready to go. All the neighbors wished them good luck. And the farmer said he was happy to be going. He was getting away from the bogart at last.
Everyone was in the car and they were off to their new farm. Free at last. And then they heard a voice. Well, here we go. At last. We're off. Said the bogus.